So now is everything up and working. So, ladies and gentlemen, my uh, subject for today is uh, flight testing of Gripen Echo, a joint test program of the next generation Gripen. Um, as you all know, uh, Gripen is the backbone of the Swedish Air Force, and I will try to give you some highlights of what we used to do and what we are planning to do in the future. But first of all, this is the one billion kronor question. Kronor is the Swedish uh, currency. So if, if all players involved in the Swedish fighter development needs to shorten a full test program with two years, and simultaneously achieve the results with one billion Swedish kroner less compared to earlier programs. So what do you do? Of course, this is the challenge that we are facing right now. Uh, Sweden is a fairly small country, and uh, the budget within the Swedish Defense Force is, is uh, limited. So this is the demand that we have both from the customer, the procurement agency, but also within our own company. So to give you a small background, I will try to cover the Swedish fighter aircraft development, the Swedish flight test community, the past and present Gripen program, slightly some issues about Gripen NG or Gripen Echo, and slightly something more about the time and money challenge, and finally some technical solutions. Uh, I will gladly welcome questions after my presentation since I'm short of time, because I guess I have five minutes for questions afterwards. So, ladies and gentlemen, Sweden uh, is a country in, in the northern part of Europe. We are a fairly large country with a very small uh, population. Nine million people in the entire city, uh, country of Sweden. It's like the uh, population of Bangalore. Uh, that means that we have to do things differently. We can't afford uh, a full program with, like some of our competitors do. We have to do things differently. Uh, Saab AB, which stands for Saab Incorporated, uh, and the business aer aeronautics has a vast experience of, of developing fighter aircrafts. We started in the, in the early 40s uh, with the B-17, uh, then matured all the way down to the Gripen program that we have right now. And Gripen is, of course, the backbone of uh, our product right now. Now, to be able to produce an aircraft like Gripen, you need to have a, a broad uh, technology and competence uh, arena. And you can see on this slide that we are highlighting several different competences that we need, and all of them are just as vital to be able to produce an aircraft. And you can see that flight test and verification is looked upon as any other competence within the company. So we are just one participant in the development process. Now, within the Swedish flight test community, there are three different players. Of course, industry with my own department, flight test and verification, but also the procurement agency, FMV, which stands for Försvarets Materielverk. They have roughly 110 people involved in flight test. And last but not least, the Swedish Air Force, the Operational Evaluation and Test Unit, with about 15 test pilots. So all of us work very closely, and you need to do that in a country of 9 million people. It's even better because in the city of Linköping, you have two airfields. On the east side of the city, you would find the Saab airfield, where you have my test department. And on the left side, on the west side of, of the city, you would find the government airfield, where you have both the FMV, test and evaluation uh, unit, and the Swedish Air Force OETU. And all of us just sit 10 kilometers apart. And we work already very intimiously and integrated, but we will have to do it better in the future. So far, together, we have managed to produce the Gripen Alpha Bravo and the Charlie Delta, which, and the Charlie Delta uh, version is right now operational in five different countries. The Swedish Air Force, of course, but also the Czech, the Hungarian, the Thai, and the South African Air Force. And as a bonus, one of the internationally known test pilot schools, the Empire Test Pilot School, comes to Saab and buy power by the hour every year on Gripen. So this is the development path that we have uh, gone through so far. The Gripen uh, Alpha Bravo became operational in 1995, and by the year of 2003, the Charlie Delta version became operational. But, as you can see in the lower part of the graph, you can see that we also have gone to, into a Gripen Future Study, which started actually in the late 90s, and was concluded in, the, in 2005, and I will come back to that later on. Now, if you look back to the Alpha Bravo verification, 
you can see that we started out with a vast amount of flight tests of, of the basic airframe. And then we had to continue with the single seat verification. Simultaneously, we, we started the development of the Bravo version and we continued as well. But you can see that the development process went in parallel, which is not the most efficient way of doing things. In the Charlie Delta version, we did the same kind of setup initially, where we started with the Charlie and then we developed the Delta. But after that, we've been integrating the Charlie and Delta development and trying to benefit of the different experiences that we found during the flight test process. And all the five different countries has been involved purely by the Swedish uh, test community participating on behalf of the Czech, the Hungarian, and the Thai Air Force. But we have also had South African test pilots integrated in our test program as well as flight test engineers. And I think that is vital to have the customer integrated early. If you look upon the amount of flight test sorties that we've done so far, from the first flight in 1988 until uh, Friday last week, we've done roughly 8,200 flight tests. You know, remember that's, that's almost 20 years of, of uh, flight test. Well, it's even actually 25 years of flight test. And that is, I, from my perspective, a very low sum of flight tests to achieve this. Nevertheless, for the development of the next version of Gripen, the Gripen Echo or Gripen Foxtrot, this is not enough. We need to be even more efficient because the budget is limited. So after completing the, the future study, we then got the decision from Swedish Parliament and the procurement agency, together with the, our company, to produce a Gripen demonstrator aircraft, which we did, and that aircraft flew by the year of 2008 on schedule. The purpose of that demonstrator was to show the current customers and the future customers that there were technologies incorporated into Gripen that we can utilize both in the Charlie Delta as well as an Echo Foxtrot version. Now, the Gripen demonstrator looks like this. It's a dual seat, I know, but still, this is the backbone of the test platform that we started out for the Echo, which is a single seat. Nevertheless, this is what we incorporated. We put in a new engine, the General Electric 414, that gave us roughly 25% more thrust. We also moved the, the landing gear from being extended or uh, connected to the fuselage to the wing roots. That got us 40% uh, more internal fuel. And we also got two more uh, pylon stations, including the possibility to put on large drop tanks. So this was what, what we call phase one. Phase two included uh, SATCOM, but also a missile approach warner and a new radar, an AESA radar. Phase three included a new avionic system, and I will come back to that. And phase four then was a modified AESA radar, which we got last autumn and we just concluded. And phase five will incorporate a digital head-up display and an infrared search and track. And this aircraft is being modified as we speak to be able to fly in May this year. So I, got, I gave you a presentation two years ago at this symposium about phase one and phase two. I will not go through them in details. I just want to highlight that we did fly on schedule the 27th of May, and we completed the entire envelope. These are open figures, gentlemen and ladies. So we have gone way above Mach 1.6 and 1.2 at Super Cruise. Now, the results were good. They were even slightly better than the simulator models that we used. So we had to update our models. These are just some pictures from, from the Swedish uh, coastline during summertime. And then we went into phase two after a small modification. That also started on time. And I, I emphasize on time, gentlemen and ladies, because I think that's vital to prove for your uh, customers that you can keep time, both starting on time and ending on time. During this phase, we also brought the aircraft to India. But before coming to India, we had Indian test pilots participating in the valuation of the Gripen and they got the possibility to uh, test the missile approach warning system at the test range in Sweden. And then we, got, we brought the aircraft down to India, and especially for the evaluation at Lee Air Force Base. Uh, this was, uh, from our perspective, a very useful trial, and then the aircraft returned back home where we integrated the external fuel tanks. So all in all, phase two and phase one has gone according to plan. Since last, we have gone into phase three. 
this, this is a major change from a development perspective. Because now we have implemented a new avionics system in the rear seat. I will come back to the to some more details. But we uh, gained some momentum by keeping the legacy system in the front seat. Because that could give us lower weather minima and we could proceed with the weather trials all year round, even though we have really shitty Swedish winter weather. Uh, because these, these have very low restrictions, while this new avionic system has a fairly high weather minima. So what do we do? We put in a new tactical system of two uh, tactical mission computers, three Rockwell Collins 6x8 inches displays, multicolor, fully NVD compatible, and we put in Ethernet network. These are COTS. Uh, so you can find them, I guess, in, in most aircrafts of today. The big thing with this is that it's an open system architecture. Uh, and we can improve the data bus structure. And by that, we can have more, de more modern uh, development methods. And we will go into model-based development. So this is how you do it. If you compare the Alpha Bravo and the Charlie Delta version of Gripen, I, I would very bluntly say that all the software is totally mixed. Flight safety critical and non-safety critical software is mixed. While in the Echo, we can divide flight safety critical and non-safety critical software by something that we call partition. And that is one of the features of the R-Ring 653. That gives us this possibility. Now we can start playing around or changing uh, software that is, is uh, approved in level D. We can change the software in the morning and we can fly testing in the afternoon. While if we start changing flight safety critical software, the aim is to change it Monday morning and maybe fly it Friday afternoon. This is still a vast improvement compared to today. Today, we, I think we are fairly quick. It takes roughly a month for a new software edition to come out, but this will expedite the development process. Phase four with this uh, aircraft started in, in April of last year. Uh, then the demonstrated program had finished. We had succeeded and fulfilled all the targets for the demonstrated program. And now we turn the aircraft into a full, full test aircraft of the Gripen Echo program. Uh, this program was just finished, phase four, in January 2013. And we finished off by doing a joint uh, setup in Switzerland together with the Swiss Air Force. And they are, as you might know, looking into buying the Echo uh, version of Gripen. During the phase four, we have continued the ESA trials of the radar and continued the avionics development as well. And this is just a nice picture from the Swiss Alps during the Axalp demonstration that we did last autumn. Now, last but not least, phase five. The aircraft is, as I said earlier, in, on, in a modification program right now. And we will put in an infrared search and track and a digital HUD. Plus, we will have an update of the ASA radar with a four-channel ASA radar. So all in all, this has improved our efficiency. That has get, we have gained some really good experiences in, in uh, uh, preparing for the ECHO program. Now, if you want to do something jointly with the government and the Air Force, uh, you need to look at how we used to do things. If you look on the Charlie Delta development, if, and let the circus have to represent costs and maybe number of flights because they are interacting, of course. The red circle shows roughly, um, uh, without relations, the number of flights and costs for the Saab part of the program. The blue one sh shows the FMV, the test directorate of the procurement agency, the amount of flight tests that they did, and last but not least, the Swedish Air Force OETU flights. So if we would take that kind of same kind of setup and prolong it into the ECHO program, that would be the relationship because it's a big, much bigger program and this is not affordable for the Swedish customer. So we had to think of something new. So one of the key strategies would be to form a joint project organization with the Swedish Defense Material Administration, FMV, and the Swedish Air Force. There should be one team and they should be co-located and they should participate and have full insight in the entire program from start. We should also use integrate, uh, the model-based system engineering because then we can verify the models early 
and we can have online, online simulations ongoing while we're doing flight tests. And we will put in functional development teams consisting of uh, development engineers, flight test engineers, but of course also pilots and technicians from all three parties. So the purpose of uh, model-based system engineering is, of course, to have early validation. You want to see that you fulfill the criteria of the customer. And as the earlier you can do that, the better it is. Uh, that will increase the efficiency and increase competitiveness. And it will, for sure, reduce development cost and development time. So this is how it works. Instead of finding out lot late that you did a uh, flaw in the design phase, you find that normally in flight test. Now we would like to find that in, during simulation. And the reason why is that this is the relationship. Now, flight test is expensive, while simulated trials is extremely cheap. So we try now to, pros to postpone as much uh, test activities as possible into desktop simulators. And we also use some other simulators that we have. And we try to minimize the amount of flight tests because, because that drives costs. So our system engineers are developing now the same kind of uh, software, both for uh, testing hardware and software, but also for subsystems, uh, functions of systems, or the entire integration of systems. And this is something that we know already from the demonstrator program will save us money. We fulfilled the demonstrator program for roughly 60% of the uh, uh, starting budget. And another good thing is that if you can keep the same uh, software from prototyping until you get the test aircraft, you can have the customer participating. So every quarter, we will have the customer pilots and customer engineers coming in and validating that we fulfill their criteria. This is how we do it in the system rig or the simulator. Uh, this, the system simulator, of, of course, consists of major uh, different parts, but we try to do the same kind of setup as we did in the demonstrator aircraft. We are doing partitioned system simulators. So we can use different parts of the simulator for testing different parts of the aircraft at different times, or we can put everything together and test the entire system. So by doing this, we can use our presentation simulator for in the marketing phase, and then we can transition into the definition and the development phase using the same kind of software. And last but not least, we can do the verification utilizing the same software. And that will uh, lower the costs. And you can see without going into details that uh, we are putting uh, different phases into the simulator uh, program. And then we finish off by using our fully instrumented test aircraft at the test department. And then we will deliver the product to the Air Force, hopefully on time, because that is mandatory for us to be on time now. So from a simulator perspective, we will have simulators uh, joining in for the entire phase of the program. The next thing, uh, this is just some fancy pictures, uh, the next thing that we need to uh, change based on the old system, we wanted to have a new flight test instrumentation system. The one that we used on the Alpha Bravo and the Charlie Delta version were good, but they couldn't cope with the uh, increase of data that the new uh, computer system uh, handled. So we had to invent the new FTI systems. We also thought of getting new telemetry antennas. Uh, and of course, then implementing the lessons learned from the demonstrator program and, and putting together test aircraft teams. Because we found that if you have a dedicated test aircraft team with mechanics, flight test engineers, and pilots, we are more efficient. Um, the flight test in instrumentation is fully uh, designed and developed and produced in, within my flight test department. So we produce all the software and the hardware for and every FTI thing that we need to do. We also uh, are responsible for, uh, together with subcontractors, building the antennas. And we are also setting up the server application. And it's all hosted within flight test, but we are, based on the contract, uh, um, uh, I wouldn't say forced, but we are oblig oblig obliged 
to get the customer to see all the data that we store. Uh, of course, we use our control rooms, and uh, we also use our own department for development, development uh, of software system. This is something that we have used for quite a long time. But, as I said earlier, to cope the, the large amount of data, we also had to find a new way of receiving data from the aircraft through the antennas and send them to Saab. Uh, encrypted, of course, because we have to watch out for uh, other uh, people uh, wanting to know what we do. And we have put in a very modern uh, system of, of handling the FTI. Uh, the antennas are uh, state-of-the-art from a subcontractor, uh, fully movable in all, in all dimensions, and they are now within this uh, globe. Uh, and they are fully uh, controlled regarding temperature and humidity. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, we now have a full coverage of the entire test arena. I'm not sure if you, if you compare the size of Sweden, but Sweden is roughly 180 miles, Swedish miles, so 1,800 kilometers long. So this test area that we have the uh, possibility to utilize is roughly 200 kilometers. So, and we have full coverage by placing the antennas on different sites of the coastline. We also uh, uh, integrated a new um, network utilizing the Defense Force uh, fiber optic cables. So now we can connect any site with our control rooms. No matter where we are in Sweden, we can connect it. And we are trying to get the possibility to even connect from other countries as well. Because this is what we want to do. We, will be able, we want to have full coverage, low level, wherever we are in the test range. And this is uh, mandatory for us. So with the new antennas position, we have a full coverage. This is a test flight low level with uh, the Dash 7 test aircraft. And you can see that we have full coverage. And the reason why we want full coverage, because now we will be utilizing another feature of Gripen. Gripen is possible of doing hot refueling, meaning that you can refuel with engines running. Normally, when we are out in the practice area and when we do high-speed trials or... Uh, high you know, uh, high fuel consumption trials. We need to go back to the city of Linköping. And now, instead, we will use one of the Air Force bases on the, on the island of Visby. That will save me maybe 10 minutes every sortie. And in an entire test program, that's a major amount of money, ladies and gentlemen. So, once again, going back to this slide, with the GRIP and uh, Charlie Delta basic development, and I said that if we continued on the same... Um, pass that we did uh, historically, we would have these amounts of cost. With the new setup now, we have showed for the customer and our program manager that we can bring the cost down. And we are already working now with the Swedish Air Force and the FMV test pilots in an integrated test team. But there are things that need to be shown because we had also to do it within shorter time. And this is the plan. I have, of course, removed all the dates because these are open uh, slides. But you can see that these are the different uh, steps when it comes to software. And simultaneously, we will do development in rigs and simulators. But what I want to emphasize on is that the Swedish customer will participate fully on the test program. And that is one you know, really uh, vital uh, factor to succeed in the future. Uh, with that, without getting the ring, I think I will conclude my, my presentation with a slide from Switzerland. We hope that Switzerland will join us on this test program within a year or so, and we foresee to have both their test pilots and test engineers in our uh, uh, department for the next five or ten years. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my presentation, and I will gladly take some questions. Yes, sir. 33. You told something about improved quality. That one? In one of the slides, I noted down the improved, uh, yeah, uh, improved quality. Can you please give me a, an explanation for that last uh, sentence? Yes. Uh, 
Um, in what terms? <laughs> yes, historically, uh, we have used different softwares in the in the early uh, marketing simulators that we used and in the presentation simulator that we used. By using the same software from the starting of, of, of the development phase until the end of the development phase, we get credibility and we get also quality. Did you cut that mic? Huh? Uh, so we get quality uh, through the entire process. Thank you, sir. You have a question up in the left corner, sir. Hi, I am Mainak from NAL. Uh, I have a question regarding your IMA architecture. Like you have given that normally you are using DO297 or an open system, which is normally for a civil aircraft, where you are uh, tweaking it and using it for your uh, military system or military aircraft. So you just want to know what are the changes uh, you are ch uh, um, changes you are thinking uh, in uh, in respect of this architecture because normally open system is for a civil aircraft where we normally think of the uh, safety of a passenger or this kind of thing not the accuracy of the system so for your uh, this one anyway, the program where a security or the accuracy is a primary concern so what are the changes you have done to this architecture well uh, without uh, going into not going into too much details because I'm not an engineer, but uh, when it comes to safety, uh, what we found out so far by using this kind of technology and this kind of, of method, we can maintain the safety criticality for, a, for the fighter program as we did earlier on with the, with the old uh, software uh, processes. Um, we are trying to use as much of, of the civilian COTS product as, as possible because that will save us money. So and we think that we can maintain the safety level. Okay. We, you are using uh, which OS, which RTOS for the 653? Which aircraft? Which OS, or RTOS, real-time operating system. Oh, okay. Too much of a detail <laughs> for me, sir. Thanks. I should have brought one of my engineers. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks. There's another question over there. I am Srinivasra from Aeronautical Development Agency. I want to know what are the challenges you faced during the implementation of the model-based design and model-based system engineering in the Gripen program? Yes. Uh, to begin with, I think one of, one of the major challenges was to get uh, um, maturity and actually to, to uh, get the, the operators to rely on this process. And that was one of the reasons why we started out with this new system in the back seat of, of the Gripen demonstrator, because then we could compare the old software model with the new model and by showing the operators and our engineers that they matched. Is it fully implemented? It's fully implemented. Okay. And, and we will now progress with the development of the software for the echo version and we use the same kind of, of methodology to keep the back seat you know, uh, updated continuously and keep the legacy system in the front seat to get the, the, tr you know, the maturity and the credibility of the system, so to say. My pleasure, sir. Yes, madam. So. Hello, I'm Anuradha Udupi from ADA, working on LCA project. I would like to know, there are um, combined uh, teams are working for a flight test. Yes. I would like to know who's the responsibility for test points generation and see that it is covered. Yes, very good question. So who, within, within the joint test team, who is responsible for the, for the test points, so to say? And this is actually something new as well, because historically, uh, Saab and FMV and Air Force has, you, has been working in series or, or in sequential. What we try to do now is that we should work in parallel and we should utilize one test point to fulfill all three organizations' requests. So we have a joint flight test team looking into all the needs from a test point perspective and trying to minimize the test points. So we should just use one weapon delivery to uh, verify all three organizations' demands. Did that answer your questions, madam? Thank you. The last question, and that is I reserve for myself. Yes, sir. Uh, 
how many platforms are you employing for your flight test program and when how much time are you going to take from start to finish on yeah. the e version yes uh, you can see that uh, this is the test aircraft 7 and then you have 8 9 and 10 so we will have three more test aircraft so four total mm -hmm. but the production aircraft of the Gripen has the possibility to integrate uh, production FTI so we can utilize the production aircraft as a test bench in different parts of the program, not for all tests. You know, high, high um, risk trials are not done with production aircraft. But uh, we have the possibility to take any production aircraft and put them on the test program. And we already tested that in the Charlie Delta uh, program. So we will mature that even further, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Ola Reginal, for a most interesting and uh, informative talk. Thank you.